Welcome to my presentation. My name is Nils Thürer. I will give the following talk on GANs for temporal self-supervision of videos. This is part of the CPR Click workshop. Thanks for inviting me and for organizing the workshop. Let me start with a bit of broader motivation. We're facing natural videos, which have very complicated data distribution. Nonetheless, they're actually really important for a variety of tasks. We want to analyze them. We want to classify them with respect to contained motions. We might want to generate new video content or um, also translate existing content into new variants and formats. Also compression, as obviously in this workshop is an is a interesting and important challenge. And now, for all of these tasks, it's really a fundamental challenge that we don't have a good analytic formulation for this data distribution. So a natural kind of overarching question here is how can we get such an accurate representation and can we actually learn that? And right, I will actually focus on deep learning methods in this context, more specifically on generative adversarial networks. And also I want to pay particular attention on, uh, I will put focus on the time dimension. So another kind of um, central takeaway message here in this vicinity is actually, please don't use PSNR metrics. So they're really not that great. And it's really, Sorry, having some lockdown fun there. It's really a horrible choice you could summarize. So that's one of the central messages here. Please don't use it. Um, I will come to some alternatives later on in my talk. Yeah, let me now describe a first kind of problem setting uh, where I want to illustrate how to, how to approach that uh, video super resolution. So here we're faced with a relatively standard learning problem. We, we're trying to get a function f of x to give us an answer y, where x is a source domain, in this case, video content with low resolutions. And we want to then get a uh, or compute a solution from the target space, high resolution videos, where, as I'm sure you can imagine, this is a very multimodal problem for some course input pixel configurations that are coming in. It's a 3D problem, by the way, right? So we have two spatial dimensions plus time. There are many, infinitely many, typically possible solutions from these high resolution, um, uh, from the target domain. And yeah, we definitely want to avoid just averaging and, and giving some, some average answer here, but we'd like to retrieve ideally many, or what I focus on, one specific good, meaning appropriate, sample from the target distribution. Yeah, um, to directly show one example video that, that I'll be using a bit in the following, um, here is a typical video. Um, I'll play it again later on. So. Um, this might be one low resolution frame that we're getting. And now we actually want to, from this low resolution, infer a high resolution output. For example, resolving all these fine pieces of the chain mail. Again, this is a low res and we'd like to get a high resolution target. And we don't only want to get one, we want to get a whole sequence that preserves details such as these chains. Now, as mentioned before, I really cannot recommend relying on kind of regular vector norms as metrics. They are very easily satisfied by smooth solutions. And um, yeah, if we actually but naively employ that, then we actually lose detail in, in the generated content. And if we, in a way even worse, also apply similar, uh, similar constraints over time, that further reduces the generated detail. As I'm sure you can imagine, um, a more or less constant signal is very easy to get coherent, but right, 
we, we actually want things to detailed content that is visible in the video. So here you can see an example. Um, you can imagine for all of these trees, there is a lot more that we could see here. It's relatively smooth. Now, if we turn to GANs, which are known to actually produce more detail here, Um, if we a bit naively apply these GAN methods, then we are faced with, with a different problem, namely that we get a lot of detail, for example, sharp edges that GAN is actually very good at producing, um, but this often is not coherent. So here you can see an example. I hope it also shows up in the, um, in the encoded video. And this is not an encoding artifact, it's really the output of the GAN in this case has a lot of fine scale detail that are just essentially flickering because they are not kept in sync over the course of a sequence. So naturally also this is not an appropriate sample from the, uh, from the natural video distribution. We are working in an area where there are quite a few works. Um, here are you know, a list of some selected ones. I will be focusing on one work from, from my group, uh, the one that is shown here at the top. And at this point, also thanks to the students who actually worked very hard over the course of years um, to, to get this to work. So uh, Rachel and you are the main authors here. Um, and also Laura, Jonas and Erik contributed to this project. Yeah, so let me explain a bit um, the, the approach here. In a way, we at first have a relatively standard GAN setup. To quickly recap, we have some sample from the source domain A of T, so one frame at time T. That is uh, the input for the generator. We're not, facing, we're not using um, any random latent spaces also here. This is fully conditional and producing a generated sample G of T for that specific frame, frame at the output. In addition, um, we have a discriminator network that now has a task to classify these uh, generated samples and should identify them as fake. And it also should um, reliably classify the real samples from the domain B as real images, typically denoted with zero and one. And we're using a relatively standard uh, non-saturating loss formulation here. So um, we're basically minimizing the negative uh, log likelihood of the um, of the classification of the samples B in the first term and then one minus that for the generated samples. And basically a similar term is then used in the generator. Um, so the, the exact same formulation for, with these generated samples in the generator is minimized in order to drive these towards zero for the, for the real sample or small values in general. Um, now, this is the core of the GAN formulation. Later on for the generator, we have a variety of other terms that I'll come back to the full details again, you can find in the paper. Now, a bit more specifically for video generation, um, we have this conditioning on the previous frame. What turned out to be also important is to actually have a recurrent generation. So we're producing a frame and then this is fed back into the generator um, where an additional important component here is this motion compensation step. It's, it's similar to a flow estimation module. And um, yeah, so this gray circle with a W that will also show up in other uh, uh, figures in the following. So this is important to basically warp and align the frames as good as possible. For the discriminator network, so in the following uh, denoted by DST for spatio-temporal discriminator, um, we now have the generated and target data to be classified. And this actually now consists of triplets. We found triplets to be really important. Um, it's actually in a way the same sequence for source and target. Um, and here we're basically inserting t minus one t, t plus one. And as you can imagine, um, I hope is from, from two samples, we could easily estimate a velocity, but three are necessary to reliably estimate changes of velocity, hence accelerations, second derivatives essentially. And this is actually a very 
important component for stable and reliable learning of the, of the time signal. Now, the two boxes that you can already see here, those are actually the original triplets. In addition, we also feed the warped triplets to the discriminator. So these are aligned with this motion compensation step mentioned before. Um, this turns out to be beneficial for kind of figuring out changes in place. However, we found both are actually important because the motion is not fully reliable. So the discriminator in a way learns to, in some cases, rely on these aligned uh, features um, to classify the signal. And in other cases, if the motion is deemed unreliable, it can fall back to the original samples. Yeah, in addition, we also found uh, the following loss formulation to be really important to stabilize generated videos. So we've dubbed this ping pong loss. Um, it's best explained in terms of a sequence. So imagine we have some sequence of inputs from domain A, so n frames in total, uh, where at the top here you can actually see the forward sequence being played one time. And then for natural videos, we can easily revert n minus one frames from that and also use it as a regular input sequence. Beyond basically physical laws, this is a perfectly fine um, sequence of inputs that should give us a believable and, and realistic output. Now, when generating this sequence in one go, backward, forward, we can afterwards, for the generated the samples produced by the generator network, we can add an additional loss term that you can see here in the middle. Namely, we are constraining these two with an L2 loss to be exactly the same. So here now I'm using the evil L2, but it's worth pointing out this is very different from, say, using an L2 in image space. Here we do not have a multimodal problem. Rather, we want to constrain the generator to produce one, one specific solution consistently for the backward and the forward paths. So this solution could have a lot of detail and none of this detail is actually averaged out or deteriorated by this L2 loss. Rather, it is constrained to be exactly the same feature in the forward and then also in the backward pass. So this actually is, is really important to, um, to kind of prevent the, the generator from arbitrarily accumulating artifacts over time and really adhering to the conditional input and also it provides a form of data augmentation. So this is, is really a good component for training GANs with spatiotemporal data. And it does not smoothen the, the output. Yeah, with that, now I want to show some examples. Here is one result produced by the TechoGAN network. And I think it's a nice example you can see from these very coarse pixels of the stairs, the network is actually able to figure out that there is some specific finer signal behind that, and it can in a way restore uh, these, these fine features in a stable way over the course of many frames. So this is a nice example of what can be achieved by a fully trained network here. Or another good example is this lizard. So here we now have four, uh, four different versions. So um, you can see at the bottom left, so over there, and the input, then the ground truth, the TechoGAN version, and over there, the DUF version. Um, so DUF is one kind of um, one existing technique uh, from previous work as a representative. As you can see, the TechoGAN version, again, is able to resolve the scales of that lizard quite well. It's actually nice to see here, the, the input barely shows, but the the lizard is breathing. You can check in the ground truth. It is actually expanding its lungs and that is actually nicely retrieved and becoming visible in the, in the generated output. Yeah, I've mentioned before, so P's and R is not a good idea. How can we evaluate these? Because it turns out the GAN, the discriminator itself is not a good metric. We cannot rely on the discriminator because it's actually trained along with the generator. It's being balanced. So it might have if we're unlucky, converge to some undesirable state. Worst case, it might have mode collapsed. And then the, the feedback of the discriminator is actually not reliable. We need some form of external evaluation of the outputs. 
And yeah, actually right, P as an R is essentially the same as L2. All these direct vector norms are extremely unreliable. Uh, just to point that out with an example again, here is a very simple case to show that. We have this black line as a signal. And if you now modify this in two different ways, the blue one is just a constant offset, in the red one, the offset is, is alternating in a more or less random fashion. For L2, there's no difference. L2 cannot distinguish these two versions because it just looks at the deviation from, uh, from the ground truth signal. And in a way, this is just one example, there's a large null space of, of solutions that L2 and direct vector norms are blind, blind to. There are some slightly better variants like SM and co, but they, they actually also, in, in practice, they are not much more reliable, slightly better only. What is a much better choice, I would argue, is to use a perceptual metric, such as the one proposed by Jang et al., uh, the LPIPS metric. Um, this does a much better job for spatial signals. However, it also it does have problems for time, or rather, it does not take time into account at all. So if we only measure this, it's also, it is far from telling us uh, the truth about the video content. So uh, what we propose in the, in the TechCrime paper is to actually use a, a perceptual metric over time. Namely, we compute, for example, the LPIPS metric, you could also use other ones, for the ground truth sequence. So for two adjacent frames, t minus one t of domain b, and then we compare it to the um, to the estimate of the perceptual distance between two generated frames. And we actually want those two to match. So if the if the ground truth, if the input had some wild changes, we also want to allow the ground truth to change wildly. But if the if the, the ground truth is, is very calm and does barely change, then we want to capture this in the uh, generated version as well. Hence we put these two in relationship. In this way we can kind of right, measure how features change over time. However, turns out this is not still not enough to fully capture the, the whole space. In addition, it turns out that we also need to take into account the motions in these generated sequences. So we've dubbed that metric TOF. What we do here is in a way similar. We estimate the optical flow between two adjacent steps with your favorite horn chunk method or in a way, also, it doesn't matter which optical flow method uh, you employ here. And now we again want the motion of the generated frames to match those of the, of the uh, ground truth frames. And in total, that actually now gives us three different metrics that we want to, to minimize. And it is important. So with this, we can actually capture changes of the content of the motion and also kind of evaluate statically what content we have in the frame. And this leads to graphs like the one shown here, um, where these three are combined. So now this is actually using the Pi app perceptual metric, but right, in a way, as long as it's good, reliable, it doesn't matter too much, LPIPS, Pi app, or potentially also future other ones. Along the x-axis, you can now see the, um, the direct static perceptual error. Along the y-axis, you can see the temporal perceptual error. So in both cases, we actually want things to be close to the origin, to the zero point. And in addition, the size of these bubbles now denotes the TOF, uh, the motion, uh, the motion error, if you want. So ideally, these are also as small as possible. And as you can see in, in this comparison, the TechOGAN output now uh, quite nicely minimizes all three, uh, all three error metrics. Yeah. You might still not be fully convinced by these, um, by this choice and, and specific combination of metrics. And um, to kind of shed some light on whether this actually matches the, the human perception well or not, we performed a, vari performed a variety of user studies. Um, the, the typical setup um, was a forced choice with 50 participants. We, tested this gives very stable um, estimates, so a thousand votes in each case. And here we compared a few metrics, uh, for example, bicubic upsampling with respect to the ground truth one, it's always the worst at the zero line. And then there are four different um, outputs here. 
as you can see, um, the, the user studies very nicely confirm overall that the estimates we get from these three metrics uh, mentioned before are actually good and in a way representative of human evaluations, which in the end is, is the important factor here. Note that we would not recommend to actually somehow average these three. You could imagine combining them, but uh, I would recommend to just measure all three and make sure that all three in relationship to each other um, or in comparison to other methods are actually small. If you're interested in the full numbers and um, the, the actual tables of measurements also with respect to other methods, please check it out in the paper. Um, uh, many methods, many additional methods are evaluated there. Yeah, so in a way this wraps up this part on um, on super resolution topics and with that I want to come to a second example to show a bit that this concept of using GANs as, as kind of video uh, generators is actually a good domain and um, also that this form of evaluation is actually a good one. Sorry, let me just restart the video here real quick. One popular example for these video translation tasks is to actually translate Obama to Trump and vice versa. And this is a good example. Here we actually, we typically cannot just say to one of those guys, hey, come into the studio. We have a video of the other person. Say exactly that uh, so that we can match it and, and compute the direct loss or so. Um, in this case, we just have to rely on, for example, White House videos. So we have a lot of them saying different things. Um, making different motions, but they're not synchronized. We cannot basically directly link up uh, two samples from these two domains. So this makes the, the whole learning problem quite a bit more challenging. But very similar concepts work in this unpaired domain as well, as I'll explain in the following. Yeah, so what interestingly turns out to be quite important in this context is to learn this in a cyclic manner. So a bit like the CycleGAN paper, also here for videos, we want one sample of domain A when it's transferred to the sample B and we want that the generator for now transferring from B to A is able to restore that sample. So we don't want content to be lost and we want these cyclic dependencies to be kept and here specifically for videos, we additionally have a conditioning again on the prevent sequence. We don't just want any mapping um, to domain B or back, but we want one that actually fits into the, the previously generated sequence. And this should happen for both directions. So one larger change is how here we now have basically two specialized generator networks for each uh, domain translation. And while, for example, this ping pong loss concept worked quite nicely, um, one important change in the context of these video translations was that due to the increased complexity of the tasks, we now actually have to, to use a kind of curriculum for the, for the learning. And we start with a simpler level, basically. We first only provide static triplets to the discriminator. In that way, it can kind of map out the, the large scale changes of the, of the image contents. Then we fade in or provide more and more of the original triplets. That way it actually gets information about the motion. And as a last kind of fine tuning step, we also provide these warp triplets such that the discrim spatial temporal discriminator can now focus on small scale changes in the generated content. And this, once it's it's trained and converged actually gives very nice results. You can see some examples. So here's a case from Obama being translated into a Trump video and also works vice versa. So we can translate Trump into Obama. And worth noting here actually the, the Trump videos do have a reduced sharpness. The Obama videos were a bit sharper just in terms of content. And um, also, you can see 
there's a bounding box fit for the head that leads to these large scale uh, changes of the um, of the heads that you can see here. Yeah, it's also interesting to look at some comparisons. Again, for more details, please uh, check out the paper. In this case, we're starting with the Trump video and uh, generating one from Obama. And what's interesting here is compared to Psych again, Recycle again, and the Psych again actually finds a solution where it basically outputs a static frame, but it can retrieve Trump again. It keeps the cycle, but it does so by actually adding in unperceptible tiny changes um, into encoding them in the in the Obama video. So this is not quite the answer. It's a nice trick, but it's not quite the answer we want to have. Recycle gun does much better, matching the motions on a large scale. But if you now compare the recycle gun and the tackle gun version, the tackle gun is actually um, better able to restore small scale features such as wrinkles um, or reflections on the skin. Um, the, it overall actually yields an increased sharpness. Again, we also performed some user studies here and um, the participants confirmed that the TechoGAN output is actually of overall higher quality. Yeah, also additional samples you can find in the paper. With that, I want to come to the conclusions of my talk. Overall, um, I hope I was able to convey a bit that GANs are actually a very powerful tool for learning the data distributions of natural videos and what turned out to be kind of particular uh, components that are important to achieve this goal are um, the discriminated architectures in especially with respect to these uh, triplet um, inputs and also the ping pong loss formulation and as mentioned before evaluation is very important in this context psnr is really not a good choice um, rather, we recommend using this TLPNT OF metrics instead. Yeah, beyond super resolution and, and video translation, there's a variety of very interesting tasks. I just very briefly want to mention a few here. Um, one that I find very interesting is to look at real-time rendering. So you can imagine streaming services for games. Here on the left side, we now have a kind of low-res, quickly generated uh, video content. Um, as you can see, this is typically very pixelated coming from these rasterization engines. This could now, for example, be streamed to a client where the client then upsamples it and produces a as good as possible high resolution um, image stream that's displayed on, on the final uh, device. And here also networks like the TechoGAN actually can do, do a very good job. Um, this is actually quite a bit harder due to the due to the aliasing. Another interesting domain is um, to look at physical uh, physical effects and and um, um, and variables. So here we have a sample from a fluid flow, a smoke uh, animation, and in this case, this is a bit of a predecessor of the TechoGAN. Um, so I think the TechoGAN results we actually also had in, in 2018 and beginning 2018 we were looking at these um, these flow resolution uh, super resolution results here the network is now working really in 3d plus time so 4d um, hence it's it's a slightly simpler architecture but nonetheless the super resolution tasks are also very interesting in the wider area of physical problems yeah and then also, video compression, I think, is a really interesting challenge. Of course, having networks that encode structures, changes in content of, of natural videos, it's a really interesting um, question how to then best leverage that to find a, a reduced, a compressed version of that video. And I think this is a really interesting uh, problem and an open, an open question for research. So. I'd be curious to hear um, how that will go in the context of, of GANs. And with that, yeah, I'd like to thank you for your attention. You can find the full source code, pre-trained models, and all the data on our GitHub page under the thing. And uh, thanks to the ERC for funding this research. And yeah, please let us know if you have comments or questions.